Well, no, the theme of this first uh, lecture is the authority of the Bible in the church. And uh, could I ask how many people have read uh, the report that was presented to the General Assembly on this article? Okay, right, I thought there would be a, a few. I have a copy, but I left it down there. Um, th it, there was a proposal in 2009 that we should alter our article of faith, Article 4, on Scripture to assert that Scripture is inerrant throughout. At the moment, or up until that point, it had said uh, that it was inerrant in all things concerning our salvation, inerrantly revealing the, the will of God in all things um, um, concerning our salvation. Now, uh, the committee, after uh, deliberation, um, decided that it would be better to keep the article of faith exactly as it is, since this proposal, uh, if you look behind the meaning of the words, was actually coming from essentially a Calvinist approach to the authority of Scripture. And uh, we recommended very strongly in that report that we should stay with the uh, Wesleyan position. Well, here we are, the authority of the Bible in the church. And very quickly there, in an introductory way, uh, a broad, uh, fairly simple approach of three broad approaches. There is, first of all, um, the idea that you will find in the Roman Catholic or Eastern Orthodox Church that Christian doctrine is to be based on Scripture plus tradition. So, for the Eastern Orthodox, not only is Scripture inspired, but the creeds formulated by the ecumenical councils are inspired. For the Roman Catholics, of course, the Pope has a certain infallibility. But at the Reformation, the Protestant or Evangelical position which was established, that Scripture alone has final authority, sola scriptura. And uh, in the subsequent years uh, in the Protestant tradition, a neo-Protestant or liberal approach uh, emerged where the view was that our doctrine was to be based on Scripture plus reason and experience. And there were different ways for the liberal tradition of relating reason to Scripture, experience to Scripture, reason to experience, and understanding how that should be. But somehow, it was to be amalgam, an amalgam of all three. Well, that's just a broad uh, outline. And what I really want to do now, uh, moving on to the next slide, is to look at this historically. And I think this is a helpful way to approach this. So first of all, in a historical review, let's look at the New Testament church. And of course, the first point about the New Testament church was that it didn't have the New Testament. So you are talking about a church preaching, evangelizing, worshiping, engaging in compassionate ministry, but without a New Testament. What did they have? They had the Torah, they had the prophets, they had the writings, which they inherited from Judaism, and of course, to begin with, they were regarded as a sect of Judaism. Those writings were not quite yet put, for, put into a canon as such. That was to happen uh, during probably the first or second century. Uh, scholars are a little more uncertain about that than they are now, when exactly rabbinic Judaism drew up its canon. It used to be said that the Council of Jamnia 1 through T, 1 through 2, we're no longer quite so certain about that. But here were these books, the books of Moses, the prophets, the writings, Hebrew poetry, and this was regarded as authoritative by the early church, the New Testament church, and you can see that in the New Testament documents themselves, where they quote from um, what we now call the Old Testament. But the other thing which the New Testament church had was the gospel. Now, I think this is a point that has been missed, and I think this is supremely important. Terence, Terence Donaldson, the New Testament scholar, has put it this way. Before there were the gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, there was the gospel. And if you look at the development of the church in the book of Acts and see it reflected in the epistles, what is quite clear is that long before the church at Corinth received the first epistle from Paul, or the Thessalonians received their epistles, and one of those was probably the first book of the New Testament to be written, long before that, they had had the gospel. And towards the end of 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 15, Paul sums up again for them what the gospel was 
which he preached to them. That Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. That he was buried. That he was raised on the third day. That he was seen by witnesses. There is the gospel in a nutshell in 1 Corinthians 15, 3 following. So by the time uh, the church in Corinth received that letter, they had already been living out of the truth of the gospel. The presupposition, not only of the four gospels, but of the epistles, is the preached gospel which came to all of these churches, the word of preaching. And throughout Acts, the word word normally refers to the preached word. The word of God grew and increased, etc., etc., throughout the book of Acts. Now, what was this gospel? Well, uh, I quoted there uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 3 following uh, Paul's summary. And what I want to suggest to you is that it is essentially a two-in-one gospel. Crucified, buried, raised, and seen. A two-in-one gospel. That's the story. That's the structure of the story. And in Acts 2.36, where um, Peter gives that first Christian sermon, that first proclamation of the gospel on the day of Pentecost, um, you have the same structure. This Jesus, whom you crucified, God has made both Lord and Christ. There you have it. Crucifixion, resurrection. That is the two-in-one shape of the gospel. And we find that throughout the New Testament. But also in verse 33, you will find that Peter talks about the Father. And already, of course, if you remember that sermon in Acts, he's already talked about the Holy Spirit. So the gospel not only has a two-in-one shape, crucifixion, resurrection, it also has a tripartite state, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And it is that central point, the Son, within which you have the two-in-one shape of crucifixion and resurrection. There is the fundamental shape of the gospel. The gospel, then, is Christ-centered, and it is triune, right from the beginning. That's there before the first book in the New Testament is penned. That is the essential gospel of the Christian church. The Father sent the Son, this Jesus, who was crucified, who's been raised, and they sent the Holy Spirit. There is the shape of the gospel. That is the presupposition for the whole New Testament. The gospel, then, is the presupposition of every New Testament book. And the gospel was proclaimed by apostolic witnesses. You remember again in 1 Corinthians 15, Cephas, he appeared to Cephas, he appeared to James, he appeared to the 500 brethren at once. Um, And you remember that in Acts, Acts 1.21, when they were choosing someone to replace Judas in the Twelve, it had to be someone who had been a witness to the ministry of Jesus and who was a witness to his resurrection. So, the witnesses, the witness, the category of witness is crucial and is key. And they have to be authoritative witnesses. Now, the authoritative witness of the apostolic generation included not just the twelve. They were the core. But there were these 500 brethren, and there were more who had been with Jesus during his lifetime, who had been there through that dreadful weekend in Jerusalem, and who had been witnesses to his resurrection. And the point, of course, is that these were the people, that generation, witnesses to his life, death, and resurrection, who were authorized by Jesus himself, the risen Jesus, at the end of each of the gospel. Go and preach the gospel to every creature. All power is given to me in heaven and earth. Take authority. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. And also, again, in the first chapter of Acts. So, at each point, these witnesses are authorized witnesses. Their authority is the authority of the risen Lord. And it is that authorized apostolic generation that then writes the books of the New Testament. So that after their passing, the continued authority of the apostles in the church is exercised through their writings, the New Testament. And it is also their use of the Old Testament which confirms that these are Christian scripture for the New Testament church. So to sum up, the authority of the Bible for the New Testament church is the authority of the apostles given to them by the Lord Jesus.
Secondly then, the ancient Catholic Church from about AD 200 onwards. And here it is their practice in worship that becomes crucial for us. Because in addition to these 27 books of the New Testament and the books of the, what was now recognized as the Christian Old Testament, there were other books being written, the Didache, the Shepherd of Hermas, the Epistles of Barnabas, and so on. But gradually it became established that only the 27 books of the New Testament were the ones which were to be used in Christian worship. In other words, long before the councils ever got round to drawing up a canon, a rule, a list, it had in fact been recognized throughout the churches that these were the scriptures in which the church heard the Word of God, the scriptures which had been authorized by the apostles, authorized by Jesus. So, along with that, not only the scriptures, but along with that went what they called the rule of faith not only the canon of the New Testament, but the canon, the rule of faith. Belief in the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And that was embedded, again, in the worship of the early Catholic Church, in the sacrament of baptism, for example. When uh, the presbyter or bishop uh, would say to the person being baptized, I baptize you into the name. That's crucial, by the way, not just in the name, into the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So, embedded in the worship of the church, you had this Trinitarian, this triadic formula. In other words, the story of the gospel. So, the rule of faith of the ancient Catholic church was the Trinitarian story of the gospel, the euangelion. Before one was baptized, one had to confess one's faith. And so, the rule of faith, which originally was in, expressed in different ways, gradually was formulated into the creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was. And here we have the two-in-one shape, crucifixion, resurrection, and then also in the Holy Spirit. And that creed, credo, I believe, I put my trust in, is the fundamental shape of the gospel. So, the creed as it emerges in the early Catholic Church is the gospel which is the presupposition of the New Testament and which is the hermeneutic for the New Testament, by which the New Testament is to be interpreted. And this was handed on by a succession of episcopoi, presbyteroi, bishop presbyters in the early centuries of the church. So, to sum up the second point, authority in the early Catholic Church lay in the apostolic scriptures as interpreted by the creed, i.e. the gospel, handed on in the tradition of the church. So, here in the ancient Catholic Church, you have scripture plus tradition. Leaping a thousand years and coming to the Reformation, we have, with Luther, the rediscovery of the gospel the euangelion. Luther, you remember, wrestling, how do I get peace with God? A professor of Bible, wrestling with the text of Paul. What does it mean, the just shall live by faith? And so, through his study of Paul, he comes to a rediscovery of the heart of the gospel. I am not ashamed of the gospel. The just shall live by faith. The result of that is, in Germany, die evangelische Kirche, the word Protestant is a political word. The theological word is the evangelical church of the Reformation. And evangelical theology is that which centers on the evangel, the gospel. It's Christ-centered. So, it's solus Christus, one of the tags of the Reformation. What does it have to say about Christ? Cross and resurrection, the two-in-one shape of Paul's gospel, the crucified one is written, and it is Trinitarian, the narrative of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So, salvation is sola fide, by faith alone, it is by grace alone, sola gratia, and it is by Christ alone, a solo Christo. The problem, you see, was not with the early tradition of the church. The problem was the growth of some of the later traditions the concept of purgatory, 
out of which came the practice of indulgences. The mass, the idea of transubstantiation, the magical power of the priest, the idea that the church as an institution controlled grace, sort of the pope put an interdict on part of the church and the faithful could not receive the sacraments, and particularly the sacraments of the last rites, they were lost. So all that kind of development leading to the indulgences, indulgences and the control and the commercial exploitation of the poor for the purpose of building St. Peter's, all of that was what Luther reacted against and over against the authority of the Pope and the hierarchy, the evangelical reformer said, well, if that is your tradition, it has to be brought to book in Scripture. And so in the Reformation, you have tradition versus Scripture, and so there emerges the assertion of sola scriptura. The 39 Articles of the Church of England, for example, classically express this Reformation, sola scriptura principle, Holy Scripture, says Article 6, containeth all things necessary to salvation, so that whatsoever is not read therein, nor may be proved thereby, is not to be required of any man to seek that it should be believed as an article of faith, or be thought requisite or necessary to salvation. You may recognize that. Because, in fact, our Nazarene article of faith is developed from that through Wesley's 25 articles the shortened version of the 39 articles that he devised for the Methodist Church in North America. So here is our statement. We believe in the plenary inspiration of the Holy Scriptures, by which we understand the 66 books of the Old and New Testament, given by divine inspiration, inherently revealing the will of God concerning us. Now, that's the phrase, of course, uh, which the report was concerned with. But it's this last section, in all things necessary to, us, to our salvation, well, and from there on, so that whatever is not contained therein is not to be enjoined as an article of faith. That is the sola scriptura of the Reformation. Doctrine has to be based on Scripture. Moving on, then, to the Enlightenment, the issues begin to sharpen. If the Reformation revealed a divorce between Scripture and tradition, the Enlightenment posed Scripture over against reason. And, of course, in the Enlightenment, you've got the emergence of deism. It emerges, uh, it appears apparently within the Christian church, but it's actually another gospel, another religion. Deism is the attempt to base faith on evidence and proof either through pure rationalism or through empiricism. And, of course, Sir Isaac Newton is the great intellectual genius of the Enlightenment. And out of this um, arises the idea of natural theology that we can prove God's existence from nature. And the argument from design, of course, was particularly um, valued. But deism marginalized the gospel story the incarnation, that Christ was divine and human, the atonement, that He died for our sins, the Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Those were marginalized, discounted, or even possibly dismissed. What mattered was the moral order, keeping the lower classes in their places particularly, and of course the idea that God was the guarantee of the moral order and that there was a last judgment coming was what mattered, and therefore preaching was about morality the gospel was sidelined. And that is precisely what Wesley struggles against. If the 18th century Enlightenment gives us Scripture versus reason, in the 19th century, we begin to see Scripture versus experience emerging, the Romantic movement. And it's in that context that Schleiermacher writes his speeches to the culture despisers of religion and takes the view that all humanity has religious experience. And therefore, in this new era, we are to base Christian doctrine not on the biblical revelation, but on the religious experience that is universal to humankind. Christianity, then, has the distinction simply of being the most advanced religion. And the result, of course, is the tradition of liberal theology. <clears throat> 
Secondly, in the 19th century, not only the rise of the Schleimacherian tradition of liberal theology, but the rise of biblical criticism. The 19th century is the era that shapes uh, the new scientific methodology of the historical critic who looks at the documents with a jaundiced, rather suspicious eye in order to find out, despite these witnesses, what really happened. The history behind the text. But of course, the presupposition was the naturalism of deism, that everything had to be explained within a closed continuum of cause and effect without divine intervention. That was ruled out from the beginning as an assumption. And this was said to be scientific. Actually, it was holding to a particular philosophical position. It claimed neutrality. It was actually a different position, but every bit as much a position as a Christian position. It was actually deism. Thirdly, in the 19th century, we have the scientific developments, notably Darwin, of course, and questions are put against the fixity of the species, the uniqueness of the human race, the age of the earth uh, becomes an issue, although before Darwin, of course, there were geologists who had talked about an old earth. The question of the fall, how does that fit into the story uh, which Darwin seems to tell? And so you've got the idea that the Bible is in conflict with science, and you get T.H. Huxley and the X Club um, advancing the thesis that religion and science had always been in conflict. Now, of course, this conflict thesis is dismissed by historians of science today, and it is rather argued that science actually developed within the context of Christian theology and Christian assumptions. But the myth of the conflict between religion and science the propaganda of the X Club actually seized the popular mind and has never been prized loose. Not only uh, the challenge which seemed to come from Darwin, but the challenge which seemed to come from Freud. Uh, on the one hand, the psychoanalysis. Uh, Freud dismissed religion as an illusion, you remember, myth and magic. Uh, and also the development of other schools of psychology, such as behaviorism, eventually leading to B.F. Skinner, with his, pin, his pigeons and the idea that you could reduce all human behavior to uh, con uh, operant conditioning. And then Marx, economic determinism. So the three great dissuaders, as they have been called, Darwin, Freud, and Marx, appear to be putting great questions to the Christian faith. And so scientific development uh, seemed to be producing this um, uh, a conflict between uh, the Bible and science. So to sum up the 19th century developments, liberal theology turned from scripture to religious experience. The Bible was a human book through which God spoke. Biblical criticism, informed by naturalism, rejected the miraculous in the Bible. And scientific developments posed questions about the interpretation of the Bible. Well, in the light of those historic developments, where do we stand today? What is uh, the Reformation or evangelical view today. So from that uh, quick historical overview, um, I want to look at different positions uh, that are taken on this issue today. And first of all, there is uh, a view which I would broadly characterize that uh, as of mainstream evangelicalism. And there here there's a broad coalition of Anglicans, Methodists, Calvin, Arminians, Baptist, Lutherans, uh, Nazarenes, a position whose roots go back to the Reformation and to the 18th century revival. Evangelical theology does not begin after the Second World War with Billy Graham and Carl Henry. It goes back to Wesley and Watts and Whitfield and Edwards and back through them to the Reformation itself. It is, in fact, the theology of the Reformation. This view would take the view that the final authority for Christian doctrine does lie with the Bible, the Scola Scriptura. However, mainstream evangelicalism would also assert the validity of the historical critical method. So it is valid to examine the Scriptures to see what really happened in principle. 
But while that was a, a very strong interest over most of the 20th century, towards the end of the 20th century, there came a new interest in hermeneutics. If the Scriptures are indeed the Word of God, then the question really is, how do we interpret them for the sake of the church? And don't let's get us so uh, caught up in issues of history that we don't actually listen to the voice of God speaking to the church. So hermeneutics, the science of interpretation, became vitally important. And this mainstream evangelical tradition would also assert the compatibility of faith and science. That doesn't mean to say that we have all the answers, but we start off from the assumption that the one God of truth is the creator of the natural universe that science examines and also the inspirer of the Holy Scripture. Fundamentalists, as I wish to use the phrase, tend to reject B, the validity of the historical critical method, C, hermeneutics, they don't think they need to interpret the Bible, they already know what it says, D, the compatibility of faith and science, they have been duped by the propaganda of the conflict thesis put forward by secular humanism. So, let me take these points one by one, A, B, C, and D. And first of all, A, the final authority of the Bible, sola scriptura. That includes all of those who wish to give the final authority, but within that, there has emerged a division between those who espouse the particular concept of inerrancy and those who think that that is a not a useful term uh, to use. So, first of all, those who inspire inerrancy would say that the Bible is inerrant on history and science as well as on doctrine and ethics. Now, that particular way of putting it comes out of a strongly apologetic reform tradition, particularly the tradition of 19th century Princeton, the two Hodges and B.B. Warfield. And in this way of thinking, an inerrant Bible is epistemologically prior to faith. And so, in some of the later Protestant confessions, not the ones of the Reformation itself, but some of the later Protestant confessions, the first article of faith is not about God. It's about the Bible. And so, the Bible becomes the foundation for everything. So, an, er an inerrant Bible is regarded as prior. And then, the deductive method leads you on to say uh, that a God who is perfect would produce a perfect book, and therefore, there cannot be any errors whatsoever. This is a position largely peculiar to the United States. It, by and large, is not the position of European evangelicalism, or of British evangelicalism, or even of European Calvinists, who have a different tradition. So it has particularly developed through that Princeton tradition and the influence of B.B. Warfield. And it is espoused by the American Evangelical Theological Society, some of the uh, seminaries such as Wheaton and the Trinity Evangelical Divinity School, etc. But its Achilles heel is the concept of an error. What constitutes an error? How accurate do you have to be to avoid error? Are you allowed to use round figures? Are you allowed to use metaphors, parables? I would suggest to you that you have never ever told any, given any account of any incident which was not to some degree inaccurate. Because accuracy is a matter of degree. You never tell the whole truth, there is always more to be said. So, it's a matter of degree of accuracy. And so, to introduce this absolutist idea of an error is the wrong way to go about defending the authority of the Bible. It is leading with your chin. It is inviting trouble. It's not that it is wrong to defend the authority of the Bible. It's a question of the way you do it and the concepts you use. So, those who prefer infallibility uh, is my second group there. Thirdly, what's the third thing I want to say, please? <laughs> right. Oh, 
Oh, yes, right. That, that was 2A, which was those who brought it. Right, okay. Uh, B was uh, the validity of the... Uh, yes, A was the authority of the Bible, right, okay, and so we talked about the inerrantists uh, under that. B is the validity of the historical critical method. Now, during the 19th century, an immense number of scholars uh, embraced the historical critical method. The great Cambridge trio of Westcott, Light and Hort, Robertson Smith in Scotland, and into the 20th century, F.F. F. Bruce, the great professor in Manchester, G.E. Ladd in Fuller Theological Seminary, Donald Guthrie in London Bible College, and so on. And today, a host of scholars, I'll not go through the whole name, in this broad, mainstream evangelical tradition who assert the validity of the historical critical method. However, today, there is a new focus on the text itself. Instead of spending all our time looking at the history behind the text, New Testament, Old Testament studies must be concerned with interpreting the text for the sake of the church. And we mustn't get uh, diverted into uh, purely apologetic issues on the historicity of Scripture and forget that we need to interpret the Scriptures for the people of God. So the necessity of hermeneutics. Hermeneutics is unavoidable. If you don't want to interpret the Bible, don't preach. Just stand up and read it. But the moment you preach, you're interpreting it. So you cannot duck the issue of how we interpret it. And the problem is that fundamentalists and some very conservative evangelical inerrantists have resisted this. And the problem tends to be that they are reading their own systematic theology into the text of Scripture. One of the great names of those among leading evangelical uh, biblical scholars who has particularly led us to uh, get into the issues of hermeneutics is Anthony Thistleton, recently retired as professor of theology at the University of Nottingham. And Thistleton has done an immense job to help evangelical people to understand the issues uh, that are involved in interpretation. So, there is a new interest developing now in integrating biblical studies and theology two disciplines that for too long have been going their separate ways. And people like Brevard Childs of Yale, Francis Watson of Durham, uh, Joel Green now at Fuller, etc., etc., etc. This is the, the, the cutting edge. This is where things are developing uh, in, in biblical studies. Then D, the compatibility of biblical Christianity with modern science. The conflict thesis of Huxley and humanism is historically wrong. And historians of science today will argue that it is significant that science, modern science, did not take off in ancient Greece. It was smothered. It did not take off in the ancient civilizations of India or China, very advanced civilizations. Where did it take off? Where did it take flight? In Protestant Europe. And the majority of the members of London's famous Royal Society in the age of Newton were Puritans. It is out of the theological convictions that God created the world out of nothing that modern science takes its rise. Each level of knowledge, science and theology, must be respected, so we may not have all the answers as to how these two levels of understanding are to be related to each other. However, the Christian doctrine of creation out of nothing is not a scientific theory, as the creationists think. That is a complete confusion of two levels of understanding. It is a doctrine of the faith. Contemporary cosmology, the Big Bang, is more compatible with Christianity than Newtonian cosmology was. It was, in fact, the Pope's astronomer, Georges Lemaitre, who persuaded Albert Einstein, with the help of Edwin Hubble, that the universe must be expanding. And so today's cosmology with the Big Bang is more in keeping with creatio ex nihilo than the idea of Newton that the universe might have continued in its uh, circular motion forever. So hermeneutics becomes an issue, and Genesis 1 has to be addressed. It is H. Horton Wiley who wrote that Genesis 1 is a hymn of creation. In other words, it is not supposed to be a scientific statement in the modern sense. It is poetry, and it has theological truths to communicate. 
Creation and fall, however, are not open to historic scientific study. Uh, we can talk about that if we want. So creation as the beginning of time and the fall as a temporal event within time are beyond the natural eye of the flesh, natural human understanding. They are only known by revelation. Well, let me add, uh, finally, before we uh, uh, open up for questions and discussion, um, the Wesleyan view. And we have some particular uh, points to bring uh, to this mainstream evangelical position. Among Nazarenes today, sadly, many lay people are more influenced by popular fundamentalist preachers than by our own Wesleyan tradition. And this is a question, this is a problem we need to address. Church leaders and theologians stand as Wesleyans within what I have described as the infallibility position. That is, that it is inerrant in doctrine and ethics, shared by mainstream evangelicals. But Wesleyan theology has some uh, particular uh, points uh, to add here. And particularly the so-called Wesleyan quadrilateral. Albert Outler was the great uh, scholar of the 50s, 60s, and 70s who in many ways led the revival of Wesleyan studies, the studies of John Wesley, and who initiated the great uh, critical edition of his works, which is still being produced. And Outler came up with the idea that Wesleyans work with a quadrilateral of scripture, tradition, reason, and experience. Now, you will remember, those were the issues that came up as we looked in that, at that very rapid historical study. Scripture, yes. Scripture and tradition together in the early Catholic Church but at the Reformation, these two seem to fall apart in the sense that later tradition, insofar as it was contrary to Scripture, was the problem that had to be corrected by the Reformation sola scriptura. The relationship of reason to Scripture is the issue at the time of the Enlightenment. The issue of experience to Scripture comes to the forefront in the 19th century. So, Yes, the mainstream evangelical position, the Reformation position of sola scriptura, insists that it is scripture, not tradition, reason, and experience, that is the basis of our doctrine. However, we cannot do without tradition, reason, and experience. These are also necessary simply because we have to interpret scripture. So these are not equal factors. The very word quadrilateral, as Outler came to see, is somewhat misleading if you think that all four are on the same level, or that somehow perhaps you've got to, you have to have a majority of three out of four in order to approve a doctrine. No, that is completely unwesleyan. Timothy L. Smith, Nazarene historian, professor at John Hopkins, suggested instead we should think of a three-legged stool now, be careful how you interpret that. The stool, or the part of the stool, the seat that you sit on, is doctrine. It rests on the floor of Scripture. And the three legs of the school, tradition, reason, and experience, indicate the ways in which we interpret Scripture. Now, if you interpret Outler's quadrilateral like that, then it is what John Wesley meant. In other words, we, the church, interpret Scripture using our reason in the light of our spiritual experience, guided by tradition, to form that doctrine. And that means that the Wesleyan quadrilateral then is not contrary to sola scriptura, but in the same way that faith alone is actually never alone, and grace alone is actually never alone, and Christ alone is actually never alone, think of the Holy Spirit. Scripture alone does not mean what at first sight it might appear to mean. The Word of God in the Bible is the source of doctrine, but it is interpreted through these three 
However, a better way of understanding that than the three-legged stool is what is called the hermeneutical circle. Because with the three-legged stool, you still have the idea of moving in one direction from Scripture to doctrine. But in point of fact, we not only move from Scripture to doctrine, from the text to our interpretation, but as modern students of hermeneutics have pointed out, we never approach Scripture with a blank mind. We always approach the text with the doctrine we have been taught already in our minds. And so to be realistic, what takes place is the hermeneutical circle. Now, of course, sola scriptura would maintain that the doctrine must be subject to Scripture. But we never get to a point where we cease to move round the hermeneutical circle, coming back to Scripture, and if necessary, being prepared to revise our ideas, even our cherished doctrines, in the light of Scripture. It's also been suggested that perhaps that's better thought of as a hermeneutical spiral, so we're not just going around in circles, but we are making progress as we get, well, deeper into the Word. Let's imagine the spiral going down the Word. Well, a summary statement. The authority of the Bible in the church is the authority of the apostolic witnesses to the crucified and risen Lord, the gospel. The apostolic generation were centered in the Twelve, given authority by the Lord Himself to be His witnesses, and they were guided in this by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. The gospel which they preached gave the Scriptures which they wrote unity and provided the key to interpreting not only their writings, the New Testament, but the Hebrew Bible, which now became for us Christians the Old Testament. The key to interpreting the Scriptures was the story of the gospel they preached, formulated in the creed and handed on in the tradition of the church.